Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming. We're very uh, pleased and honored to host this morning a uh, member of the Knesset, Dr. Uh, Benny Begin. Uh, you all received his CV, so with your permission, I'll, I'll give just a, a bridge. Uh, don't count on these CVs. I don't know who wrote them. <coughs> Be careful. Okay. Uh, this is usually these are these are unreliable unre sources. sources. Okay. So, so uh, having said that, uh, uh, member of the Knesset Begin uh, studied geology, the Hebrew University, and then got his PhD at the Colorado State University. Uh, between '88 and the '99, he served as a member of the Knesset and the Foreign Affairs Defense Committee. Uh, then returned to the Geological um, Institute. It's good for a Knesset member to have a profession, right? In case helpful politics uh, change. Um, and then in 2009, he was elected again as member of the Knesset of the Inner Cabinet until uh, 2013. Again, went into his uh, research and uh, scientific work, and then in 2015, uh, again was elected to the Knesset, now is a member of three committees, women's status, interior, and law. Uh, wrote many articles uh, and books. I believe one was the history of the kingdom uh, of Judea. A chapter in the history a of chapter. Judea. And also a book uh, called Set Story, right? Uh, a set story. A set story, but which describes a set story. Set story, uh, <laughs> not very uh, improving of the Oslo uh, process. If I, no, I think we all agree. It's a set story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I want to thank my staff for arranging it, and uh, please turn off your uh, cell phones. I'm sure. Nothing will come from the outside will be as interesting as Mr. Begin's uh, uh, speech or lecture or talk. And uh, stay tuned to our next uh, events, Mr. Begin. Uh, okay. You, you chose the, the title, uh, Art of Balfour, Mahmoud Abbas, and Peace. So without yeah. further ado, please. Yeah. And I, I don't think there's anything secret in that. So from my point of view, it's open, but uh, okay. you have your own your own tradition. Let's try. Let's try. Let's try this. So I see all of you, and all of you see me. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, this CV was rather accurate. I think I wrote it. <laughs> sent it to you. Uh, a detail that I failed to mention. Let me see what you omitted. Usually I mention my good wife. Hey, Becky is married to Ruth Shore, a social worker taking care of disabled soldiers through gardening on behalf of the Ministry of Defense. They have six children, ages 51 to 36, and 18 grandchildren, ages 19 to 4. Why did you omit that? And it's no secret. I wanted to leave it so, to the end. I wanted so to that's fine. They asked me for a CV. I never count on other CVs. Sometimes they are terrible. Uh, OK, I, I'm not sure that you are all that used to a politician that uh, comes with a discount key, key and a and a slideshow, but uh, I think it would make uh, the things I want more. I, I want I want to say more structured and therefore maybe shorter, so you'll be able to ask whatever is on is on your mind. Uh, uh, you know the opposite of that. It uh, eight years ago it was a, a very successful slogan used in the in the uh, United States of A. Uh, but that's the antonym of, uh, of that slogan, this and uh, yeah. you'll see in a minute what I mean. Uh, <clears throat> this book is rather voluminous, more than 400 pages. It is called Palestine, or Palestine, or however they call it in their language. 
uh, only a year ago. No, this way. And uh, it was written by a rather busy person, the so-called supreme, uh, supreme ruler, supreme leader of, uh, of Iran, Ali Khamenei. It is strange. Why would he devote all that time to write such a book? For him, it was evidently important. And the, the main, the, in a nutshell, what it says needs 400 pages. Israel has no right to exist. This is not based on European anti-Semitism. He's free, of course, of anti-Semitism. But on well-established Islamic principles. And what do these principles teach him? A land that falls under Muslim rule, even briefly, can never again be ceded to non-Muslims. I guess Jews are considered non-Muslims by definition. This is a little strange because, as, is, as you know and illustrated here, the, the closest distance between an Israeli border and the Iranian border would be some, something like 600 miles or kilometers, 1,000 kilometers, however you, you, you measure it. There's no border dispute. There's no claim on part of any Israeli uh, government. And yet, that's what we hear. An explanation for that, coming from different sources, we've been hearing uh, over years, is, I'm, no, I'm sorry, and, uh, and as a, in symbolizing that uh, policy is those banners, this is taken from Tehran at a certain time, in English, so all of you can read it and understand, Israel should be wiped out of the face of the world. And a friend of mine translated the Iranian language uh, for me, and it says Israel must be wiped out of history. So what I heard so many times is that we don't have to worry about it too much because this is, and you know the quip, this is rhetoric for domestic consumption. Don't worry. That's the way. Uh, people sued themselves in face of such an abomination. Problem is that we know that this rhetoric has been, for many years now, exported. It was exported to the Iranian proxy on the shores of the, of the Middle East. And here is Hassan Nasrallah, a so-called general secretary of uh, Hezbollah, the party of God. No one can give up Palestine. No leader or king can give up a grain of Palestinian soil. What does it have to do with us? There's no actual, at least not serious, border dispute between Lebanon and Israel anymore. The border was delineated under the auspices of the prestigious United Nations. Uh, but suppose it does. And, and I think that he's very serious about it. And as a token, if you want, for that, that these words have been translated to actions. They have amassed, people say, about 100,000 warheads, not missiles. Very few missiles. Some people confuse between missiles and that are more accurate uh, and rockets. But it could be mortar or rocket heads. Eh? That's quite, quite uh, an arsenal, and uh, all of it is directed southward towards the Jewish state of Israel. I think that under these conditions, people agree that there's no avail in trying to think out of the box. I mean, you can turn it around, right, left. There's no solution to this abomination. And you could say, with our so-called Western minds, or other minds, Eastern minds, whatever, that it is irrational or even insane. But there it is. And it is very material and practical and threatening. 
No one really proposed a solution to that. But these, as you all know, are Shiites, and Shiites are known to be uh, to have adopted an, an extreme version of Islam. So let's turn from Shiites to Sunnis. Sunnis have been known as as uh, uh, as, a, as benign people, like ISIS. So we turn from Shiites to Sunnis, and we see the leadership of the of uh, of uh, Hamas, the Islamic. Uh, acronym for the Islamic Resistance Movement. Uh, that's an offshoot of the uh, Muslim uh, Brotherhood, emanating from uh, from uh, from Cairo, from Egypt, uh, in the 20s. That's about 100 years ago, and then uh, exported to Turkey. Uh, and this is an excerpt excerpt from the Hamas Charter, the land of Palestine. I would say again. The land of Palestine is an Islamic holy land for generations of Muslims until the day of judgment. It is forbidden to neglect it or any part of it or to cede any part of it. There we are again. These are Sunnis. I think that the immediate conclusion is that it would be impossible to reach a long term stable peace agreement with Hamas that includes an article that even indirectly recognizes Jewish sovereignty in any corner of Palestine, of Palestine. All right, so these are religious Sunnis. Let's turn to secular Sunnis, and here they are. Okay. These are considered to be non-religious Sunnis. Is Salam Fayyad on, on the left, and uh, Chairman Abbas, who was re-elected only uh, last week. And, uh, and let's see what can be done uh, with their basic beliefs. And I have proposed for a long time now that Israelis, I'm not talking about other, Jewish Israelis, suffer from a great misconception. And this is it. The assumption of mirror image, of reciprocity between Israel and the PLO. Whatever we are able to do, they must be able also to do in the following sense. If we, Jewish Israelis, or Jews around the world, if we can sign an agreement that includes the seeding of Beit El, Shechem, and Hebron, the historic cities that hosted our ancestors, our forefathers, 3,000 and 2,500 years ago and, and 2,000 years ago. If this is the case, so then the PLO can sign, of course, an agreement that includes the seeding from their point of view of Beit Jibrin, which we refer to as Beit Govrin, near Beit Shemesh, Ramla and Jaffa. That's the assumption of symmetry, which I would say is, is, is rather natural, rather human, but that's not the case. And I think this misconception is the source of the hopes or illusions that have uh, uh, were risen many years ago in the two rounds of negotiations in the last uh, 16, 17 years. So let's turn to 2000 in Camp David, beginning of 2001 in Taba with these three notables. And again, the misconception was that negotiation, negotiations failed because Barack didn't treat Arafat nicely in, in a civil manner. Here it is. It pushes him to the hut to the bungalow there in in uh, in Camp David, of course. These are, these are nonsense. But it, it it took the minds of many people and, and 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 serious interpreters. So let's see what really what really happened there, and let's try to learn it from the 
most intimate source of the negotiations, in some ways more intimate than Prime Minister Barack, is a good man, he's an academic, he has a profession already, uh, so he saved himself ultimately from politics. He was foreign minister under Prime Minister Barack, is a, an eminent historian in our terms today, a leftist, a liberal, a member of of a so-called socialist party, the Labour Party, and of course his Shlomo Ben Ami. And in September 2001, I would refer you to this quite amazing interview, long interview with Ari Shabit in Haaretz. Uh, I'm taking only small parts of it, but it, 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 sh it should be read in order to understand the whole picture. And September 2001 would be seven, eight months after the collapse of the talks in Taba, let us remind ourselves that Prime Minister Barak sent to Taba the twin Yossis, the twin Yossis to negotiate on his behalf, both Yossi Sarid and Yossi Berin. Who would be the, a better negotiator from these two Yossis? I'm sorry, <laughs> one of them, one of them, my friend Yossi Sarid is deceased. We, we mark now two years. Uh, I was taken away in a minute, but, but they negotiated, and they also failed. That's what he had to say, uh, Shlomo Ben Ami. We are faced with a question, whether there is a Palestinian recognition of the right of a Jewish democratic state to exist in this part of the world, as I've been putting it in any corner of Palestine. And he goes on. They cannot compromise. From their point of view, the process is not about reconciliation, but about the rectification of injustice, of undermining our existence of a Jewish state, of a Jewish state. That's not an extreme right-winger, warmonger Benny Begin. That's Shalom Ben Ami. With, with, with an insight that he gained following more than a year of intimate negotiations, doing his best, concession after concession, until they reached uh, a deadlock and a wall. So let's see what this statement means and where it comes from. Many Israelis adhere to the so-called solution of two states or two peoples. Of course, on a day-to-day -day basis in interviews, we have the tendency, and people abroad have a tendency to shorten it. It's just too long for communication, so they say, the two-state solution. But originally, at least for Jews in this country, it's the two states for two peoples solution. But the position of the PLO is different for them. It's two states, period. Why? Because there's no Jewish people. For them, there is no Jewish people. Just a Jewish religion. Judaism is nothing but a religion. And let's try to understand why it is so important for them and since when. So it takes us back to the title of the, of the lecture, to the Balfour Declaration, the letter, written by Foreign Minister Arthur Balfour to Lord Lionel Rothschild, Rothschild, we call him Rothschild, His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. And that was considered immediately an insult. And if you want to sympathize with those who felt the insult, uh, you can, because there was a clear distinction there between the aspirations of the Jewish people to reestablish their national home and other people residing, living in P 
Palestine at the time are referred to as communities for which not national rights should be kept and uh, observed, but civil and religious rights. That, of course, under the assumption as five, year, five years later adopted by the League of Nations to the effect that uh, they would see to it that under the mandate the Jewish national home would be reconstituted in their historic homeland. And of course, the United Nations organization inherited the resolutions from the League of Nations. So let's see, why do we mention it? You could see, you could easily say, that's a part of history. That's, I was told a while ago, there were many resolutions and many letters. Why, why do you refer to this? Here's the reason. That's September 20, 21st of this year. That would be uh, three months ago, right? And Mahmoud Abbas makes it a point to use the time allotted to him in the United, the United Nations General Assembly only recently to have said the following. A hundred years, actually 99, have passed since the notorial Balfour Declaration, by which Britain gave without any right, authority, or consent from anyone the land of Palestine to another people. This paved the road for the Nakba of Palestinian people and their dis dispossession and displacement for their land. Let's note, in 1917, there was no partition resolution by, by the UN in 1947. There was no war in 1940, between 1947 and 1949. No Nakba, no 1967 occupation. This statement goes right to the source of the animosity, of the hate, of the inability to accept the notion of Jewish sovereignty anywhere in Palestine. Here it is. And of course, you'll note that, uh, that uh, the PLO, uh, time and again, uh, in recent months, tell us that they would like to appeal to the International Court uh, and ask the British government to apologize for the injustice that, in, that they incurred to them back in 1917. So it's very deep, that's what I'm trying to say. Without judgment, I'm not trying now to judge it morally. I am trying to impress it upon you that this sentiment is not something which, which is ephemeral. It has been with them, it is with them, it will be with this type of leadership and this leadership for years. Why is it important to know that Jews are nothing but a religion? if you can say that, because a religion is not entitled to sovereignty. A nation is. So, with this, say, knowledge or understanding or insight, we can now better explain it think, logically. It is logical from their point of view. It is consistent from their point of view. That's what I, I'm trying people to, to, uh, to, to I'm, I'm trying to have people understand their logic without judgment. Uh, so this is the second round with now not a, well, a Nobel Peace Prize laureate, arch-terrorist Yasser Arafat. It, that just tells us how funny this world has become. Uh, this is Mahmoud Abbas on the left, yes, and uh, uh, Prime Minister Olmert on the right. And I think it would be appropriate <coughs> to uh, refer again to the, to the main points or to the main concessions proposed by Prime Minister Olmert during the year or so of negotiations at that time. Okay, 
a Palestinian state on an area that is equal to the area of the West Bank in Gaza, 96% directly and the balance through territorial swaps. 100%, not accurately in the same lines, but the equivalent of 100%. Two, a safe passage, a road, a bridge, anything. Under PLO control, connecting Gaza to Hebron through the checkpoint in Tarkomia, but it will be today checkpoint. There will be no, there would have been no check, no Israeli checkpoint at the time. Three, an agreement by, the, by Prime Minister Olmert to divide Jerusalem into two capitals, conceding our sovereignty on the Temple Mount and the and the and the Mount of Olives, the so-called uh, sacred basin, and replacing it instead by an international sovereignty in the Temple Mount, Mount of Olives, by the United States of America, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, the PLO, and yes, thank God, also State of Israel. And five, admission to Israel, that's what Mr. Olman said, he agreed to admission to Israel by of several thousands of refugees within, I don't know, five or, or, or ten years, symbolically and on the basis of uh, humanitarian issues. What was their reaction? Again, we're, it was a host of, of nonsensical stories about it. That they couldn't uh, accept it because Mr. Olmert was actually a lame duck. It was at the end of it. Uh, he fell under some accusations, etc., uh, etc. Et These are really nonsense. The PLO leadership at the time for at least a year or two, I don't remember, never claimed that. They were serious. I think they are serious people. I don't like the opinion, but they view things seriously. And what I will bring to your attention now is an interview by Mahmoud Abbas in the Washington Post to uh, your colleague Jackson Deal and I think another colleague of his. Uh, at the end of May, of 2009, there would be eight, nine months after the, the, the break in the, in the talks. And he was asked, why did you decline this, this, this wonderful proposal? And this was the reaction. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm trying to be accurate. So I'm quoting from Jackson Deal's article, Abbas turned it down. The gaps were wide, he said. And I'll let you stretch your imagination and try to fathom how come with that proposal on the table, not to refrain from saying there was still a gap to be bridged, but to say the gaps were wide. What would be an explanation for such a far-reaching, short, and I think accurate, from his point of view, accurate statement the gaps were wide on the basis of their expectations, of their hopes, mm -hmm. of any plan that they can accept objectively. So when he says the gaps were still, he says the gaps were wide, I think we can understand what are the prospects of any government in Israel in the foreseeable future coming into terms and signing a long-term peace agreement uh, with the PLO. The other issue is the issue of uh, refugees. I'm, I'm using here an old map. This is uh, a British mandatory map, I think 1945. Uh, they, had a, they had a good mapping survey in Tel Aviv. We inherited the building in 1949 in, I think, two, one or two Lincoln Street in uh, Tel Aviv, a very prestigious institute. So this is the old map, and I'm purposely uh, using it because it carries all the names of the, of the Arab villages and towns 
of the time. And I bring to your attention here in, uh, in, 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 in bold, several of them, south of Bet Shemesh, Zakaria, today Zakaria, Ajur, Agur, Beit Jibrin, which we call historically Beit Gubrin, and Beit Natif, which is actually very close to Natif Alamed Hay today. I also call your attention to Malcha. You're a Jerusalemite, you res reside here, so you know what Malcha is. Okay, just a neighborhood. And these people, or some of these people, or many of these people, reside today in the two refugee camps in Bethlehem, the Haisha and Aida. Please note that these residents, as displaced in 1948, they had to move or to be displaced a distance of 30 kilometers, 20 miles. They stayed in Palestine, in Palestine. They're not in Syria. They're not in Mia Mia in, in Lebanon. They're not even in Jordan. They are here. And within their brethren in Bethlehem and close to Hebron. And still, and still, which I take very seriously. This is the entrance of the Dahisha refugee camp. Aida. And you see, of the Aida refugee camp. And you see that the emblem of this demand to return to their practically actual old homes is very vivid in their minds and in their hearts and with the ladies carrying the keys on their necks. Mm -hmm. And they are very serious about it. And if these people demand to return, to move again 30 kilometers to their actual homes, and if they do not exist anymore, to the actual coordinates in which actual place, exact accurate place in which these houses uh, were built at the time. So what can we expect from people who, who stay there in the Yarmouk uh, refugee camp in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Damascus? Uh, or in, uh, or in um, Sabra, or Shatila, or Mia Mia, um, in, uh, or in Khilwa, in, in, in Lebanon. The problem is that this personal issue, so to speak, has been adopted by the PLO. What you see here is just a, a photo, a screen photo, print screen, of, of an official map by the uh, Palestinian Authority TV. There's no other TV station there. And it shows you the PLO flag envelopes the key and the key stretches over all of Western Palestine. Again, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to, to convince you is that these feelings and this rationale is very seriously deep in the hearts and in the minds of so many of our neighbors. But then, when you tell a, someone from the PLO leadership, and especially Mahmoud Abbas, they say, we cannot give it up on their behalf. We cannot concede it. This is a personal right of each and every refugee that under Resolution 194 of December 1948 may return or should be able to return to their homes with the, uh, with the stipulation that he must uh, declare, I think, or at least express his will to live in peace with his neighbors. If this is a personal issue, it's a personal right for each and every refugee for the fourth generation, the grand-grandson, no, the son of the grandson, fourth generation. There's no, no such status for any other refugee under the auspices of the United Nations organization. And therefore, from the PLO point of view, suppose 
they do negotiate again, they would say, we cannot see it. We are not their representatives as, as a crowd, as, a, as an assembly, on behalf of their personal dreams and ambitions. And I do take very seriously this statement by Mahmoud Abbas, by Abu Mazen, two years ago, at the uh, PLO revolution, the Fatah Revolutionary Council, so to speak, spent a day on the issue of refugees. And in the uh, summary uh, speech, in the last speech in, in that uh, seminar, so to speak, Abbas said, that refers to his age, two years ago, I'm 79 and I do not want to end my life as a traitor. <coughs> I take it very seriously, very seriously. Yes, he cannot do otherwise. And only three months ago, again, there are six million Palestinian refugees multiplying and multiplying, of course, under, under the, 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 uh, the um, uh, sole re uh, individual, uh, no, I would say, uh, exceptional uh, definition by the UN, already six million ref Palestinian refugees, I think he purposely used this number, waiting to be given what they deserve and enable them to return to their homes. You didn't believe me five minutes ago. To their homes, according to UN Resolution 194. Being that the interpretation of, of 194, they say, what can we do? It is beyond us. We are unable. That's why the title of this slideshow is No, they can't. They really can't. So like Hamas, the PLO holds that <laughs> Palestine is sacred waqf, land, that no part of it can be ceded, like Hamas, like, like, like the Iranians, like the uh, like the uh, like the Shiites, like uh, in, in in Lebanon, that, like Hezbollah, and again, people have that tendency. I don't know where it comes from. That in this specific case, they can think out of the box and turn the box around and around, and the solution would be found. There's no reason to assume that. I would even say, on a political, on a realistically political basis to assume that in the environment as I described to you, Iran, Lebanon, and Gaza, to assume that the only organization that will stand up and say, we don't care what the, what, uh, what, uh, the Iranians tell us. We don't care about Hezbollah's policy. We don't care about what our brethren in Gaza say and declare. We stand up this small, rotten, corrupt organization, and they say, we stand up. We'll do otherwise. We'll stand up and we be courageous and sign with these Jews an agreement, a long-term agreement that is in total compass to the basic beliefs and understanding. No, I say, they cannot. In this respect, one should make a distinction that most Israelis do not make. There is a very deep difference between an interim agreement, any interim agreement, ceasefire, truce, armistice, and a long-term peace agreement. The difference being, in this context, that in an interim agreement, you sign a local understanding, local in time and in place, you think it is local in time, and the parties can still go on and live with all of their ambitions, expectations, and dreams. Not so with a long-term agreement, mm -hmm. with a real agreement, you need, you must include an article saying 
th this way or the other, you choose the wording. This agreement marks the end of all claims on both parties. No, no other claims, and the PLO cannot sign such an agreement if it includes any quota, any number, you give me a quarter of a million, a million, any number of refugees that would be able to return, thereby, of course, ceding the so-called right of return to, uh, to their brethren, and of course, recognizing the Jewish sovereignty over any part of Palestine, as we discussed, hence, that would be the reason mm -hmm. why Hamas, back in 2008, expressed a total negation objection to sign an agreement that in the future will include the article, this agreement <coughs> marks the end of all claims. At the time when they expressed this objection, they didn't know what, what would be the outcome of the negotiations. But in principle, they were asked, would you theoretically be willing or able to include such an article and the, and the answer was time and again, no. I think when people talk today, some people, I think uh, people with no real understanding of the situation, but it's abroad, some of them even here, they yearn for a so-called uh, coerced agreement, that is, agreement that would be signed and executed, forcing the parties to execute it, I don't know about a future government in Israel, but I know about the PLO. It would be impossible to coerce such agreement over the PLO. And if someone or an organization of an international community or the Security Council will try to impose it on them, either one of them signs it and immediately be eliminated, but it would take a month say two months, maybe two weeks, or, which I think is a more realistic expectation, the organization will be uh, uh, disbanded, will be disintegrated immediately. So it cannot be coerced upon them. And uh, I'll refer again to Shlomo ben -Ami. At the end of the day, even the most moderate, that is himself, reaches a point in which he says to himself, wait a minute. For these people on the other side, there's no end point. Another quetch, okay, Yiddish, another squeeze, is not an Ashkenazi, but is uh, trained. Uh, another quetch and another quetch, they are never satisfied, there is no end to it. And there you see a recent Fatah Facebook uh, page with the PLO flag hoisted uh, on all of Western Palestine. This is where we were led under the slogan, the PLO is the solution. This is where we are if we want to carry on this totally false assumption. And uh, I think this is a fair description that uh, in order to have uh, any real hope for signing an agreement with the peer, with with the with an, an Arab leadership or a leadership of the Arabs residing in Judea and Samaria and Gaza, it would involve of necessity a fundamental change in their in their leadership. Uh, final remarks: uh, agreeing, I hope, that no agreement is possible. I actually didn't refer to Hamas, that's a different story, of course, and has become a separate story, maybe a separate mini-state in, uh, in Gaza. There's no agreement even with the PLO, and there are only two possibilities, if I quote from me and the Colonel with, with uh, Danny Kay. Uh, some of you are old enough uh, would remember it. There are always two possibilities, but there are only two possibilities. Either we stay in Judea and Samaria, or we withdraw. And if, we want, if you want to weigh the reality uh, of these two sole uh, possibilities, I'll bring your attention to this post. This was uh, published in 
at least one newspaper at the time that I read, but I think in many newspapers. And I, uh, I uh, translated it. It was on behalf of 150 or 60 people, senior officers, reserves, of course, uh, and the IDF and other from the General Security Service. And Mossad, withdrawal from Gaza is good for our security. To our professional opinion, in the lack of a partner, the plan for unilateral withdrawal contributes to the strengthening of the state, and it is essential for Israel's security. They would not be able, they would not be willing to publish a similar ad if the proposition to be discussed in public would be again a uni unilateral Israeli withdrawal from Judea and Samaria. This is over with for the next generation, at least for people who have some memory, who understand what were the consequences of that move and therefore abandon is to be erased from our political minds. The alternatives, some of them are more dangerous, some of them are detached from reality. I don't want to discuss them, it is not even important and so as tortuous the road as it is, Israel's future, our future, cannot hinge on the goodwill or ill will of our neighbors. Proof, we have been prospering in the last 70 years, despite all obstacles, and, uh, and here we are, despite sacrifices, despite thousands of victims of, of, of wars. And we are here in Jerusalem, we are having bold time, having tea and, and cookies, and uh, quietly discussing political matters. So it is a marathon, a marathon race, and it takes time, and we need a very long breath and when people ask me, so you're pessimistic, and I say, so? no, I'm based on the past. Uh, my extrapolation towards the future, and there's no other way of doing it, is rather optimistic. And if you're so patient to hear my nonsense, that's another, gives me another room for optimism. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Far from being nonsense, I think it's a very compelling uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Let's open up for questions, or you left them speechless. <laughs> Either stunned or convinced. You choose. Uh, still, yes. So, Just. Uh, um, Prime Minister Begin, as you know, uh, it's the anniversary of the Golan. Uh, Prime Minister Begin, your late father. The real, the real Begin. <laughs> <laughs> right. The next uh, Golan Heights. Uh, exactly 35. Was it 35 years ago today? Um, do you think Israel should annex Judea and Samaria? I'm sorry, I have to be impolite and, and correct you in the terminology. Uh, Judea and Samaria are a part and parcel of our historical uh, homeland, actually recognized as such in uh, 1922 by the League of Nations uh, that was almost at or a little later or earlier uh, uh, to uh, Winston Churchill's uh, decision to, uh, to, this, to, uh, to partition Palestine into Eastern and, and Western. So it is our country, the hills around us are the hills on which our forefathers walked and our judges judged and our kings ruled. Uh, so you don't annex your own country. What we did in the Golan, we did firstly in Jerusalem in June of 1967 uh, with a very large majority uh, in the Knesset, we extended our jurisdiction and law to some parts of uh, our homeland. As for Judea and Samaria, I, I uh, am a little confused by some of my colleagues to the effect that I see different, different uh, proposals. 
one says, let's, let's do it, let's, let's extend our law and jurisdiction uh, to Gush Etzion, because in 1948, actually, there were Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish settlements there, and Jewish communities, and others say, no, let's extend it to Male Domim, which is in close proximity to Jerusalem, it's the hinterland of Jerusalem, and some people say to the so-called sea area, and some people say to the whole of, uh, of Judea and Samaria. Uh, my approach is, uh, I think, different in the sense that at this moment, I don't see the real advantage of it. I think we are we're making it good. I think that the very fact that we have reached a situation by which uh, more than 400,000 Jews live in Judea and Samaria, apart from the neighborhoods of Jerusalem, 100,000 of them on the, on the mountainous backbone of, uh, of uh, Samaria and Judea, actually the, the heart of our homeland here. And I think it says a lot about our ability to stabilize ourselves and to root ourselves deeply into our land so I wouldn't uh, hasten, I, I wouldn't rush uh, to extend it, although uh, basically and in, and in principle uh, we have a, a, a basic So it's the fact, de right facto, de facto, de facto and not the euro? I, I don't think that you can say, you can refer to the existing situation as uh, as a, an extension de facto. I don't think so. <clears throat> uh, I mean, but whatever you call it. Uh, yes, applying the right of Jews to live and establish communities in every part of the home. I think it should be considered inconceivable and unacceptable that the only place in the so-called civilized world in which Jews would be barred from establishing residence and establishing communities and Jewish community centers and synagogues would be in their homeland. If there is a Bethel, Ohio, why cannot be a, the original, a, 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 Jewish, a Jewish community in the biblical original Beit El, the house of God? How, how, does that be cons how can that be considered an obstacle to peace I don't know. I, I, uh, I have my own opinion on the ultimate political solution to this area. You, I think you know about my position, but it is irrelevant. Suppose you have a different solution. Suppose there is this way or the other. There will be established an independent sovereign state, Arab state, uh, in Judea and Samaria and Gaza, to me in anathema. But what then? Could, couldn't Anyone imagine that under these political conditions, Jews would be allowed to live in these parts of our home? And whatever the political solution is, or the political arrangement is, depending on their own free will and personal decision. Okay. Yuval. Uh, Yuval, yes. Uh, 